Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland. This is relaxation, hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And just to let you know, the website's up and running again. It was offline for a, about a week, and now it's back. It is back. And I don't know if you've received any emails from Spotify, but they've been sending out like these uh, like stats to let you know how much you you know you've listened to each podcast. <laughs> So when a few people, excuse me, contact me, sharing the the image with me, and it's sort of saying how many hours you've spent listening to my podcast. I hope that if it does end in your end up in your email box, that you you welcome it with open arms, and don't think to yourself. Have I really spent that much time listening to that weird man on the internet? No! Ah, so there you go. I thought... I thought today... It's very early in the morning. But... The last couple of days have not really been... On top form, so I'm just easing myself into it as it was, as it were, as it will be. I'm taking my time and I don't know. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. It's stuff happening. You know, this is life, isn't it? Everyone's got stuff happening. Um, in fact, okay, here's what I'll do. I'm going to talk about this stuff. And I'm going to call it dealing with bereavement. Dealing with the stress, anxiety of bereavement. And I made a recording. The only, the closest thing really to this that I remember doing is I made a recording, I think, the day after my nan died. And I talked about it. Um, it's somewhere. I don't know. For those who want to look up, look it up. It's uh, it, it's somewhere. It's probably something perhaps I shouldn't have done, but I just had the energy to want to talk about it. So I have found in the past that dealing with sometimes the most you know simplest of things that you could you know I say travelling on a bus I do bring that up a bit sometimes but travelling on a bus going to a wedding When it's not my wedding, wouldn't always poked his head out. He's literally just aimed his anus. He's, he's on his back, aimed his anus at me and started licking it. I'm coming, Andre. That's just grim. You do it if you could. No, I wouldn't. I don't want anyone go anywhere near your anus. <laughs> Ugh. No, you're wrong. No, 
trust me go go away so <clears throat> got a bit of a cough as well lovely it's it's a weird thing because sometimes things that aren't supposed to that generally the general public or perhaps would think were simple and easy things can sometimes be stressful and anxiety producing for people that have anxiety and stress conditions or issues or responses where the words you want to give so when something big does happen I don't for me personally I don't always know the correct way to respond because I sometimes I do feel I have felt like a social outcast in the past for my behaviour or not knowing how to behave in some of the most basic scenarios and to have a having a a big negative response to something that everyone else seems to be enjoying you know like a party or loud music or even aggression some people love to watch people getting aggressive and fighting and stuff I can't be around people to argue if they're arguing I can't be around I cannot be around it because I feel my stress levels rising and it annoys me because the idea of giving my remote control you know remote control to someone else to be able to control my stress levels does not sit well with me considering how much effort I put into not allowing that to happen and trying to help other people to not allow that to happen but it sometimes does feel like I'm just you know here's, here's a weird scenario it feels sometimes right like I will walk get on the bus and I will hand I say there you go bus driver there's remote control you know just however you drive just you know, just control how I feel there you are loud person on the phone there you are school girls at the back giggling and laughing I start thinking they're laughing at me why would they be they might be but you know it's just it's almost ridiculous the idea of just giving everyone you know getting a hundred made I've got them all over the room loads of oh, if everyone anyone, anyone visits me I said there's remote control you know, just control my t you know if you want me to feel horrible just press that button yeah thanks but the fact is the reality is if you gave someone a remote control and saying uh, the green buttons for me to feel good the red buttons for me to feel absolutely awful uh, stressed terrified anxious and the blue button is just nothing just for me to feel just normal neutral a lot of people probably the majority of people would, wouldn't go in nowhere near the red button but saying that if someone had me in remote control with the power to press that red button I might want to just from a mischievous perspective <clears throat> but if it was known in reality and this was just like a known concept and they knew that if they pressed the red button that you would feel awful or I would feel awful it's unlikely they're going to press it 
which means that people perhaps are pressing when they do press the red button it's accidental because they don't know what it is and then you realise that no one's got remote control over you doesn't exist this is a made up idea that I just made up and no one else is responsible for how you feel and the idea behind that sentence is to take back your own power. <coughs> to take back this blimming cough. To take back your own... To take back responsibility for how you feel. I think... I think in a kind of a, kind of a reality... How many of us really want to take responsibility for how we feel? I don't think I do. Not really. I bullshit myself. You know, I want to be in control of how I feel. I will not be in control, but take responsibility. This is how I feel. Let's stop being a victim. Let's stop blaming other people for how I feel. Let's stop blaming other people for my life. But the idea of that one is to not blame yourself either. Is to get rid of blame. Because as long as you've got blame in your head, in your mind, in your heart. I blame you, you're to blame, I'm to blame, this is to blame. You're never free from it. As long as you've got blame going on, you're never free from that blame. You're always blaming someone else or they blame, they're blaming you. You're blaming them, you're blaming yourself. You might be around people. Blame is a learnt thing, isn't it? It's not something we're born with. <clears throat> you know, if a baby's sucking on a, a, a mother's bosom... And the mother is, for every reason, unable to produce enough milk for the baby. And it happens sometimes, it's just a physical thing. Uh, it could be temporary, it could be a condition, but for whatever reason, you know, maybe it can't produce quite enough milk for the baby. The baby doesn't start staring and pointing at the mother. That's your fault, that is. That's your fault. That's not how babies think. We're not born to think that way. That is taught by the parents. We do have a bit of it when we get older, but which way we go is really dependent on who we're around. If you meet someone in their 50s or 40s and they're always blaming other people, you're to blame, one to blame, you're to blame. Guaranteed, meet their parents. Parents would probably be the same. All their brothers, sisters, some of them. They'll be different, but they'll still be that. An underlying um, blame, kind of little blame culture within that person's life, whether it's friends, work colleagues, whatever. So for me, the freedom of not blaming others is not blaming yourself. But is that the same as not, you know, is is that the same as not taking any responsibility? It can kind of feel like that, can't it? Like, I'm not going to blame myself. Therefore, I'm not responsible for anything I do. Wow. Thanks, JJ. No. Although I have done that in the past. I have kind of gone down that road. Of <laughs> literally just like taking no responsibility, but it's freeing. It is. It feels freeing for a short time, but then you end up. Well, you're no longer an adult if you think that way. 
you know, if you want to think, if you want to be a, you're no longer an adult. In fact, you're, what would be the way to explain someone that takes no responsibility for anything they do? They're not to blame for any of their own actions. It's like going with a sledgehammer and smashing someone's windscreen and saying, it wasn't me, it was the hammer. Or maybe, I, I'm not at fault of this. I'm not at fault. That's, sometimes that's, I think, why people like the idea that everything's planned. Their whole life is planned ahead of them. And they have, it's a journey and they've got no control over what happens. And it's going to happen anyway. Okay. Fair enough. So, well, you know, let's let's see what's going to happen. So you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, uh, you're going to go on a cruise, you're going to do all these things. Okay. All the things you do before the age of 60. So that to a 20 year old, so that's what's going to happen, yeah? We'll now just lay in bed for the next 40 years. See what actually happens. Don't ever leave your house. Stay in your bed. If you're still alive, you can sit 40 years, obviously, if you live that kind of lifestyle. Tell me about the cruise you had, about the wife or husband, children. What, none of that happened? Well, surely you would have met the love of your life by sitting in your room. Never leaving your house. What? How? You know, this is back in the days before the internet as well. I mean, I suppose there are ways around it. <laughs> I don't know. That'd be a bit weird. But there probably are ways of meeting people. But it's not quite the same, is it? Thing is, you might meet someone online, but you don't know if they're smelly or not, do you? You don't. <laughs> you don't know. You see, like, lovely, they might have bad breath, they might be smelly, they might peek their nose. All the things that I do, it might be like me. So, just because you see a picture of someone on, on a telephone, you know, looking, scrolling down, or swiping right, swiping left. Oh, they're lovely. I mean, why have they got a really high-pitched voice that makes your ears bleed every time they laugh? So, this is me leading up to bereavement. This is what I do when I leave up, lead up to bereavement. Um, wandered off a little bit there, but it's alright. <clears throat> I think the point, I was laying the groundwork for... Really... How... Do I deal... With a bereavement when I struggle to sit in a, a restaurant or you know a public place a cafe or a coffee coffee shop without without feeling my anxiety rising you know but then with a bereavement You're kind of supposed to feel shit. That's, that's, it's natural. So a bereavement isn't a time when you need hypnosis. Of, it's not a time when you're supposed to feel good. You may, you may find help to deal with the, uh, the social functions, you know, going to the funeral, dealing with the stress and anxiety. Which is something that you can do. There's lots of exercises. I've, put, you know, I've done lots of exercises on here, lots of relaxation sessions. But ultimately, if it's someone that you care about deeply and they've passed away, feeling awful, feeling upset, having lots of confusing thoughts, sometimes even kind of attacking each other in a way you know like the inside your head that's normal it's natural I remember when my nan left when my, when my that's a weird word isn't it when my nan left 
when my nan left the planet, the day before her funeral, I had dinner with a, a lady that I've known for a long time, ex-girlfriend and her kids. And we just went for lunch because I was visiting. I didn't live in that town, so and I'd known her for a long time. So we went and had lunch, and she was... Um, She said something, and I was like, oh, okay. And I think she, at one point she said, what's wrong? I said, what's wrong? So she re she really said that to me. I said, what's wrong? And one of her daughters said, "He's Nan's dead and he's going to a funeral tomorrow. And she said, oh, I'm just trying to cheer you up. Like she was sort of, I don't know, telling jokes or whatever. And it dawned on me that that's not what's needed. It wasn't her fault. And um, I might have said to her, I think, is I don't want to be cheered up. I don't want to feel happy. I don't want to feel any kind of pleasure at this moment actually I want to feel the bereavement I want to feel the pain because this is at the time you know the most important person in my life had passed away so I wanted to feel it however weird that might seem I wanted to feel crappy I didn't want to go down the same route as I've done in the past with the mood disorder that I've got where I've gone to funerals in a good mood. Gone to weddings feeling foul like there's a wed like it's a funeral. Like not having any kind of concept of what's really going on, which is how I used to be when I was in my twenties. You know, I'd feel honestly, really, I'd feel Christmassy in summer. That's what I was like just all over the place. I didn't didn't seem to be fit in to what was the reality of life, you know, be at a funeral and something would make me laugh. A lot of that's the awkwardness of the situation, but, you know, at my nan's funeral, you couldn't have, nothing in the world could have made me laugh on that day. In fact, some, some things happened that really annoyed me. But, you know, it's just the way it is. But anyway, I didn't want to feel good. Now, I don't suggest staying in that state for any length of time. But for that week or for the, the time that I was there, and I broke down at the wedding. I, I had a pretty much had a meltdown, which has never happened in public before never 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 broken down in public I was I lost it I completely lost it um, but my dad grabbed me which is weird I thought he was trying to pull my head off but he literally grabbed me and like Dad, I can't breathe, get off. <laughs> and, uh, very strange, very strange kind of situation. But there was something, I, I was having a, an anxiety attack, kind of, well, I was, my, Anxiety was raising higher and higher, and my breathing was being affected while I was going through the funeral. While I was in there, in the in the church, and <clears throat> I had to put all my concentration, all my concentration, all my uh, energy into being calm, so that I could get through the funeral. Because all every pretty much atom of my existence wanted to get out of that building. 
All I wanted to do was to get out of that building, but I couldn't. I could have done, actually, to be fair. The reality is I could have. But I didn't want to. Although I wanted to, I didn't want to. I didn't want to... Because I know that would have distracted the funeral. And I didn't want to distract from my father's grief and his brother's grief and sisters and, you know, my nan's children. I didn't want to be a distraction from them. I've probably spent my life being a distraction too many times in the past. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, I suppose, be an adult. It might have took me 50 years to get there, but I'm trying to... Not, I don't want to be serious. <laughs> I don't want to be a serious adult, but just try and, as I got older, I want to show a little bit more respect, if I can. What I've noticed is I've started to want other people to show respect to me, which they don't, sometimes. So, yeah, bereavement. Okay, this is the longest introduction to a recording, and to be fair, the recording's going to have to not be too long, because otherwise it's going to be really long. So I, this is about really, it's a complicated one in a sense of someone's passed away. You feel awful. That's an understatement. If, it's, if you care about them, if you're close to them, let's say. You can care about someone and not be close to them. You know, it's, you can be in an office with someone and see and only see them run for the other side of the office and maybe spoken to them twice at the 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 lift or so you know what I mean you might have hardly ever spoken to them but if they suddenly died and you'd feel sad because you'd suddenly they're not there anymore and so you don't have to know someone to feel grief And I think sometimes it's an opportunity to experience a bit of that. To It takes the focus from ourselves. Although some people can turn it into a being about them. You know, I had a friend who's no longer alive actually. But he, he, was in, he worked in the office. He was, worked with me, next to me in the office about 15 years ago and he his I think like his step cousin had died he just got the information that his step cousin had died and he came into work anyway which I did question like that didn't seem like a very good idea if someone he, he said he was close to her but all he kept going on about was why me why does this have to happen to me? Not me, him. He's talking about himself. Why me? Why? And he had a breakdown in the office. And he went and... He got sent home. He had to go home. But he... There was something about that that really... And he, cause he was talking about the why me... And then he really went into the why me. So he was... I've never seen that before. Not really. Not in that extreme way. Someone really believing that the world was against them. To actually to the point where somebody else dies. And you feel sorry for yourself. Then after thinking about it, there's probably, everybody has a little bit of that feeling. I reckon that's, that's part of the grief process is we feel sorry for ourselves 
because we're not going to get to see them again. Uh, if we care about them or love them or we, we feel sorry for ourselves because we're not going to get to speak to them again. The person has gone. With my nan, I feel sorry for myself sometimes. I try not to, but I feel sorry for myself because I no longer have anyone to visit. I haven't lived where she lives since I was 20. Not, yeah, so 30 years. And I used to visit her. I moved closer to her 20 years ago, but it's still the next town, and I used to visit. But I miss that. I miss being able to just call her up and say, Nan, you alright? Who is it? It's Jason. Who? Jason, what do you want? What do you want? What do you keep calling me for? <laughs> so you know, I had a good relationship. And I used to call her and say, do you need anything from the supermarket? Uh, I used to have a regular day. I'd go and visit her quite often, Friday. Depends on you know what I was doing, when I, where I was, where I was working and stuff. I'd buy some cakes. I would have some cakes, cup of tea. It was lovely. Watch Deal or No Deal on TV. So perhaps part of the bereavement process is actually it's natural. In some ways, every feeling is natural, I'd say. But if you go straight to why me, then that's that's a different. Um, I mean, he was ill. He was ill. Um, and I see that <clears throat> sometimes the victim mentality. If someone else can die and you still feel like the victim in that situation, that's that's pretty extreme victimization of yourself, isn't it? Or being a victim. And I've talked about victim being, you know, the, vic the victim mentality. And it's that blaming. You're to blame, I'm to blame. Because that does have to come into it. To be a victim, someone's got to be blamed. And, for so, you know, I'm going to blame myself. Other people blame me. But quite often victims, they blame other people for blaming them. So a victim won't blame themselves. They'll blame other people for blaming them. Which will be this kind of a weird concept. So bereavement brings up lots of different things. This isn't like some kind of expert analysis of bereavement. But I'm thinking from a stress situation. Because... Some of us put up so much pressure upon ourselves generally, you know, just generally, day to day, um, which perhaps we don't need to put a bit too much pressure on ourselves to behave a certain way or to think a certain way, <clears throat> maybe being critical to ourselves because we're not perfect specimens of humans well sorry to break it to you but that's probably never going to happen to be a perfect specimen of anything in fact if I'm honest I don't want that for myself I don't want to be perfect no way no I'd like to be able to walk up and down the stairs adequately enough for me not to slip and break a bone but I don't necessarily need to walk up and down the stairs in such a perfect fashion that uh, I win awards if there is such a thing stair walking award 2020 so when something actually really big like a bereavement happens
it 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 it's a winding experience you know like physically in a sense of like knocks your breath away a little bit a little bit depending on the situation maybe a lot but you get your breath back you have to breathe you know you get your breath back but it is almost like an injury it's almost like bang out of nowhere especially if it's something you didn't see coming or you didn't know was about to happen see I'm not going to talk about my own personal family situation that's happened this week because my dad's asked me not to he said please don't talk about what's happened on the internet I thought you meant just on Facebook but then I started to think maybe he's listened to my podcasts and he just doesn't want me to talk about that specific thing so I'm going to respect him respect his words and I'm not going to talk about the person that, or the situation that's happened but I am taught about bereavement and and that is something that I think is I was going to say prepare for but how the hell do we prepare for it you know in a way I mean if someone is with someone that's slowly dying a horrible situation to be in the bereavement or the bereaving starts long before they die and then when they do pass away of course there's the there's there's no preparation for that even though you're prepared you feel prepared there's still no preparation there's also no preparation for maybe the relief that you may feel the relief that the person is no longer suffering the relief that you no longer have to suffer because watching someone else suffer without sounding a bit crass if someone's in a coma the person sitting at the bedside is suffering more emotionally the person in a coma is suffering physically but they're in a coma they're not aware of what's going on they're you know if a chemical coma or just a natural coma the person sitting at their bedside the husband wife child father son uh, whatever it might be the person they're the people that are suffering in that situation the most emotionally and I don't think that's given enough people that go through that not carers necessarily although carers obviously should do amazing people but the amount of people that are like unofficial carers they wouldn't class themselves as carers because it's their husband or their wife or their son or their child you know uh, or their parent they're not their carer the the potentially that person has a carer to come in twice a day three times a day but they're the ones that are there they're the ones that are doing the real work the emotional work with that person that they care about so when the person does eventually pass away they may feel a degree of relief and there comes the guilt huge guilt potentially 
how can you feel relief for the, someone that you love so dearly dying? So it's a horrible bunch of feelings that arrive that are natural. Yet again, we start giving ourselves a hard time for it. So although we can't necessarily, I don't know, prepare for a bereavement as much as perhaps we'd like to, or not like to, you know, it's not a nice subject. How do we prepare emotionally for something that you know is going to have a big effect on you, on your stress levels, anxiety levels as well? So my answer to that is by learning to relax now. Learning to relax when that stuff isn't happening. Learn to meditate. To be fair, it's not even learning. You just do it. You know, it's not... If you sit in a chair, close your eyes, count from one to ten. Do nothing else but count from one to ten. One to ten and then back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then count back again. I mean, you can do it in your head. You don't have to do it out loud. It's like one, two. You've got your eyes closed. Your body's just resting in a chair. And you've got sounds going on around you, maybe. You might have people in the room. You might have people in the building next to you. It doesn't matter because you don't need silence to learn to meditate. And I know this for a fact because I used to... I learned to meditate in a town center, in a room above a shop in a town center, it was the Buddhist center, and there'd be people outside screaming, drunk people shouting and singing. It made no difference to the meditation at all. So, learning to do it now, learning to relax yourself in whichever way you want to do it the more you listen to my relaxation sessions the more relaxed you should naturally feel anyway in a day to day situation and if you you know if you prepare not with bereavement in your head, not thinking oh, I'm going to prepare for a bereavement, but just prepare yourself in a sense of the more you relax, the easier it is to relax. The more you relax, the easier it is to relax. And the more often you spend time relaxing, just like muscle memory in fact it is muscle memory because your muscles relax if someone's an athlete um, they, they learn body muscle memory so a boxer for example uh, a person in their 90s who used to do boxing when they was younger they might not have done it for 50 years if you walk up to them and put your hands up and go to sort of punch you don't really go to punch them obviously because they're a 90 year old but if you kind of you might even just mess around and say oh you used to hear you used to be a boxer their natural reaction might be to punch that person not Consciously, 
they just do it automatically because of the muscle memory because like any physical activity any sports like footballers anyone whether it's athletics tennis the the they've repeated the same movement maybe millions of times so that it's almost that neural network is in your brain connected to that muscle movement that punch or that swing of the tennis racket or catching a ball yeah like a cricket player uh, someone that catches balls um, or a baseball player so, you know, the catcher I mean, it's an amazing skill but they're never going to lose that skill even when they're in their 80s and providing they're you know, physically able to catch a ball, they're going to have those reflexes because it's naturally going to happen. So if you chuck a ball at a professional, a former professional baseball player, who, I don't know much about baseball, but whoever catches the ball, you know, the ones with the big pads on, they will always have that reflex for the rest of their life because they've learnt it it's inbred not a good word is it inbred inbuilt rather into their brain and it's automatic they haven't got to think about it so if someone chucks a ball at them or something's coming towards them that could actually um, hurt them you know what I mean it's a ball maybe someone's playing cricket or something in a in a garden and the ball goes over the and it's heading towards them this 80 year old you know could take a, a boink on their head and it could be awful but if he's a former cricketer or baseball player or whatever he'll catch that ball providing he sees it obviously but he's automatically he will catch <laughs> you know I'll just I've got an image there just you basically it will catch automatically there's the automatic muscle memory that's there and that's what we create when we learn to relax and you know the myth is learning to relax and meditate where whatever happens you're going to be calm and cool and bullshit you're a human being relaxing learning to relax and becoming better at it and spending more time feeling calm doesn't take away the fact that you're human and the simple fact is however much we don't want to be reactive or we maybe want to be someone who responds and doesn't react and we can learn to be like that where we don't hardly ever re react it's more responses so you know we move away from that reacting we still react we still <laughs> we do and we're always going to in our lives at some point it's natural so let's not give ourselves a hard time for being human the difference is the reaction would be in your mind first so unlike someone that perhaps uh, is unaware and has given himself or is unaware in that situation doesn't have a lot of self-awareness maybe or doesn't care I am who I am I'm going to stay the way I am nothing's going to change me that kind of person who well actually if life doesn't change you then there's something wrong with you we're, we're affected by what happens to us the big things but over time and I'm not talking about every single thing that happens to you in your life. It's all about over time, we're affected, we're changed. And that's a good thing. Every time someone passes away, it changes us if that person is close to us. And I don't think that's a necessarily a bad thing. It changes us. We, we become who we are person speaking to you now is not the person that used to work in a comedy club that person's gone 
I'm not the person that was laying on the beach reading Freud's book of Freud's life story back when I was 18 that has gone that person I don't even I wouldn't even recognise them now so we changed but we still have that essence we still you can meet someone and say oh they're still the same as they ever were well you know what chances are if you don't see them very often if you only see them every few years they might revert back to being how they were when they were last with you muscle memory that connection they haven't seen you for a year or two years or five years as soon as they see you they might revert back naturally automatically to being the kind of person they were then they may be a bit more lively a bit more rude a bit maybe more aggressive maybe or they might be calmer it could be could go the other way see if I meet up with my old Buddhist friends from who I used to live with from 15 years ago if I meet up with him or when I meet up with him I'm karma uh, yeah it's a more peaceful conversation there's no there's, there's no aggression but other people I meet up some of them are quite aggressive I'm not really particularly aggressive I don't really I'm not got no time for that that's although I can be I can get into that mindset Ugh, I'm boring myself so I suppose although I'm going you can say I'm kind of fleeting around from place to place with this conversation there's so many there's so many ways that we can judge ourselves and we can give ourselves a hard time my question would be why why give yourself a hard time life has enough challenges just let's say use the word challenges life is hard enough let's just use a cliche life is hard enough why make it harder on ourselves by being unkind to ourselves by being judgmental to ourselves by giving ourselves a hard time by picking ourselves up on everything that we do that perhaps isn't exactly how we'd like to be because ultimately we can't can't control we have no control over how other people treat us we can manipulate it and the simple fact is the nicer you are to other people the nicer they're going to be to you it ain't that complicated now not everybody's going to be nice to you if you're nice to them but more people than not will be if you go out with the idea in your head that everybody's against you and you know you really don't like people and you know you think someone's going to want to pick a fight with you and you go into a nightclub and that's that's the only thing you're thinking chances are you're going to get into a fight if you think that everybody loves you or I don't know really I'm not a big fan of that idea but you know the, the everybody if you think that way of course you know that could lead to being a narcissist or whatever but you feel better about yourself 
So instead of the everybody loves me bit, you could go thinking, people like me. I'm a nice person. Other people are nice. Other people are out to enjoy themselves. I look good. I've, you know, I washed my bum. You know, I'm feeling very clean. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm, I'm a catch. You know, you could, there's a positivity there. Like someone who feels, they can feel good about themselves instead of feeling negative about other people. Or negative about themselves. So that is a way, you know, it's a very simple way. If you try it, actually, if you've just got to go to the garage or to the shop, and just, as you're walking to the shop or to the garage or wherever it is you've got to go, if you just repeat to yourself, in your mind, making sure that you're very aware of what's going on around you, you know, if you're crossing roads and stuff like that, you're not focusing just on your mind, you're focusing just on the words, the words are there, but you know, you're not giving them all your attention. And you repeat something like, I'm a friendly person. People like me. People want to be around me. I'm a friendly person. People like me. People want to be around me. I'm a friendly person. So if you do that, repeat that. You don't have to sort of do all three of them. You could just say, I'm a friendly person, which is probably the, the main one out of those three. But just repeat it as you're walking to the shop. I'm a friendly person. And you'll notice as you say it, there'll be a little, uh, almost a rhythm as you walk and you say it. As you're walking, I'm assuming you're walking to the shop because I imagine most people seem to drive places. So you could, those old, that newfangled cars that you use, don't know what's wrong with a horse and cart. What's next? Travelling to the moon. Uh, so you could, even if you're driving the car, you could repeat to yourself, of course. You have to give your awareness to driving. That's the most important thing. But just the journey to the car and the journey from the car to the shop, maybe. You know, I'm a nice person. People like being around me. People like talking to me. I'm friendly. Or a friendly person, people like you know something like that. I did this a while back just to test it. I've done it before in the past, but you know it's not recently. So I thought, oh, I'll do this. And I walked into the garage, the petrol station. I walked into the petrol station, and one of the staff started talking to me, and he didn't, did never normally did that. So I was in a queue. And he started talking to me about um, sugar or something, like um, Coca-Cola and stuff. We just started talking. And I was like, wow. And then there was the lady was there and her till broke. So she had to go to a different till, and that till wasn't working very well. So there was this big queue of people waiting. So I could see that they were getting frustrated, she was getting frustrated. I could relate to that because I've not worked. I've worked in places, uh, customer, you know, we're using a till and till breaks and stuff. It's not fun. So what I did is I let about two or three people ahead of me because I wasn't in a hurry. I didn't have anywhere to go. I was just going there to get 
to pay for something and then I was going home. I didn't have any any plans. So this, uh, me walking there going, I'm friendly, I'm nice, people like me. I'm friendly, I'm nice, people like me. Had an effect, genuinely, genuinely had an effect upon my behaviour when I got there. And it was almost an enjoyable experience. I was chatting with the people that were with me, that were queuing, having a laugh. And instead of like the the normal conversation would probably be, oh, I can't believe I have to wait this long, I'm in a hurry, and moan, moan, moan. I just, just, I don't know, it was kind of more of a, a lighter conversation. Yeah, that's this stuff can really work. So what happens when you listen to let's say relaxation sessions regularly? It almost starts it builds that muscle memory. It creates that connection in your brain so that when you need it you can feel more relaxed and sometimes in a situation like bereavement you need to be able to relax into it grieving is so important to be able to grieve and I've noticed as I got older, I grieve about things. I, I grieve, not just people that have passed away and died. I grieve about, at my age, 50, there's grieving towards things I haven't done. Uh, opportunities that I messed up really good opportunities that I didn't take at the time I mean when I was 20 probably 22 maybe 23 I don't know uh, 4 oh, anyway early 20s I got an opportunity to have a television documentary made about me and because I had a friend who was a BBC producer and she wanted to make a documentary about me about my life at that time and I said no because I was worried about how I would come across I was worried that my family would be embarrassed by me whether or not that was a good decision I don't know but We don't get that many opportunities necessarily in life. And that's a big opportunity. That was, uh, yeah, it's a real, that was a real chance to do something. To sort of build a career or, you know, so yeah. But anyway, I didn't take it. And I, I grieve those things sometimes. Uh, relationships. Girlfriends that I had, or girlfriends that I could have had that I didn't pursue, or you know, for whatever reason. When I was young, and now I'm not, I'm not young anymore, and yeah, I do. I, I grieve that stuff. I grieve. I grieve being able to. I, I grieve my back. I think. Grieve, grieve about my back my lower back with pain and it used to be I used to do martial arts done boxing done all kinds of stuff over a 30 year period and I was always fairly fit 
now, not so much. I'm not sort of unfit, I'm, but just my lower back is uh, out of order, pretty much. So I regret not, it's weird, I regret not appreciating my lower back while it was working perfectly. So I think that's normal. I think it's a normal thing, maybe not to aim at a specific body part, or maybe, but to, you know, I mean, I suppose really, I'm saying grief, so a lot of people just use the word regret. But it's more than just regret. The energy connected to it is more powerful, more deeper, stronger than just, oh, I regret that. And although I do regret quite a few things that I've done, and I know it's a cliche, I didn't really believe it, if I'm honest with you. But as I look back, there's more things that I didn't do that I regret. The things, regretting that, things I didn't do, opportunities that I didn't take. That would be, there's more regrets there than the things that I did do. But that's probably because I didn't do that many bad things. I've done a few really stupid things, like really stupid things. But my biggest regrets, maybe not my biggest regrets, but uh, more of my regrets is what I haven't done, what I didn't do. Like settling down, having a, being, you know, having a wife, having a wife. Getting married, it sounds a bit old fashioned, having a wife. Maybe, you know, taking a plunge. Taking a plunge again, that's taking a plunge, that's something you put a plunger down a toilet, don't you? When it's blocked with poo. That's taking a plunge. Plunger to the toilet. So, there, it's not a good uh, example for marriage. Or is it? <laughs> so. So I think for bereavement, it's not just about somebody passing away, although that is, grief and bereavement is kind of classed as that, isn't it? When you, That's the first thing we generally think about. Oh, he's, he's bereaving at the moment. He's, um, oh. So there's been a there's been a, a death in the family or okay. But actually somebody could lose their house or move out of their house or have a family home get sold by the parents and feel a bereavement or their loss because that house meant so much to them. Here's a bereavement I had is my friend he had no choice, but he had to um, stop the comedy club because the rent was put up by hundreds of thousands a year. It was a huge amount of money. And he couldn't afford the rent anymore, so he had to close. He had to end the business. And I was there for the closing night, the closing you know, party. And I just... He gave me a sign, one of the signs from the club. So I've got it in my... I had to stick it on the wall at one point, but I've got it as a sort of a keepsake. But that place meant so much to me for 20 years. And, I mean, well, longer than 20 years, actually. 25 years or 24 years or whatever. 25 years I can't remember how long it is it's been closed now but I loved it I loved that place I loved that building I loved everything about it and it closed down and 
I still I I don't I don't have the the grief of regret because I didn't uh, you know none of what happened was to do with me and um I've got nothing to regret really other than leaving I kind of regret leaving there and moving away but I moved away because of my nan so I moved away to be close to her so that's not something really to regret but partly I regret because when I left there in 2001 that was kind of the last time I really had any fun like regularly every weekend I was having fun and it hasn't happened So for 20 years, I've not really, there's not been any regular fun. So I regret leaving for that reason. So yeah, there's, oh, I grieve that, you know. So it's, it's, this is me talking about bereavement and grief. There was a point to this, there was, and I don't know what the point is now. It's maybe something I've talked about. I've not rehearsed this. I've not. I'm not. I'm not written it down on a piece of paper. I'm just talking from my heart. And if it's been rubbish, then I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to waste people's time. But if it's been rubbish, you wouldn't still be listening anyway. <laughs> to be fair, if you're still listening seventy minutes into something that you think is pointless, then my suggestion is you need to stop doing that. <laughs> you need to, you know. <laughs> but when someone, like, when a bereavement comes up and it's almost like it's time to bereave now, Talent, time to grieve, and whether it's the bipolar or personality disorder or whatever that's going on with me, I don't always know how to react. And I do, I'll be honest, I do sometimes go down the road of why me? And I know that that's not healthy. I also know that it can be quite natural. if it only happens occasionally see if we're continually saying why me why me in life then that's hugely unhealthy mentally and emotionally for the person doing it and it's probably not a huge amount of fun for those around them either Because that person's probably blaming you or blaming everyone else. So, yeah. But I do like the idea. Here's something I quite like is the more you get used to relaxing. The more you get used to relaxing, it is almost there's a gap between feeling something and responding. So let's say someone insults you or says something that you think is insulting or you're unhappy about or whatever it could be. It's a million different scenarios. In fact, it's probably more than a million. It may, say, it may seem like I've said about a million different scenarios in this recording. But there's that gap. Which is the difference between responding and reacting. Resp reacting has no gap. It's like, you said what? What did you say? You yeah. know, instant, instant reaction. 
which is not necessarily very useful for yourself and from uh, an anxiety stress perspective it's very unhelpful because it goes from this has happened to stress you know instant no that's not useful so the more you relax the more time you spend relaxing so if you're able to sit down or lay down for even if it's only half an hour a day where you just relax and let go or you listen to a recording or something like that that gap starts to get wider so you no longer react you respond and responding takes some brain power it, it requires thinking reacting requires no thinking that's automatic uh, quite often bullshit coming out of someone's mouth it's just reactive and it's quite often the same stuff you know it's just and we're all reactive at times you know to get to the point of being responsive to respond rather than to react in all situations I don't know if it's possible I don't know it might be so again don't give yourself a hard time if you react I react sometimes I respond more often than I used to I react less than I used to I used to be very very reactive like you know it was almost like I was walking around with no skin and anyone touched me like ow ow like I was raw now I don't, I'm not like that anymore but at the same time if you flip it over you just say well I want to be I want to be like a rhinoceros rhinocerosaurus or whatever and have big thick skin like calluses which means no one can ever hurt me yeah the problem with that is if no one can affect you emotionally it means you can't feel pain which means then you also can't feel pleasure so you know being able to feel pain is very important it's not pleasurable feeling pain well for some people like it but if you look at people that have there's a disease a disorder not a disease it's a it's a disorder, a disorder that some people are born with it's very rare where they can't physically feel pain and the amount of accidents and the potential of dying is huge because they can't feel pain so they could literally be talking to you leaning on uh, the hob of an oven and burning a hole in their elbow and not even know about it whilst talking to you because I guess it's not just not feeling pain they can't feel they don't have physical sensations in their in their body well I'm not quite sure how it works it's all to do with the brain anyway and then the elbow you know can end up losing their arm or it going septic so we need to be able to feel in specific uh, literal terms we need to be able to feel pain although if you listen to my recordings you know there are ways of reducing it but you need to be open to feeling new uh, emotional and physical pain because that's the physical pain is to let you know that something needs your attention you know from a doctor or from someone you know but 
from the same point, emotional pain also lets you know that attention is needed. I don't think there's anything wrong with being a human being. Being a human being means reacting sometimes, saying saying the wrong thing sometimes. I mean, I've you know I've got a history of saying the wrong thing. I was almost famous when I was younger for saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. Whatever the wrong thing is, doing the thing that other people doesn't that don't like. Being a human being just means we're not perfect. If you're aiming for perfection, then aim for perfection in a certain thing. I think that's okay. And possibly a lot of fun. But you're perfect. In fact you are perfect. As you are. So there you go. That's perfection. Just being here. You're alive aren't you? You're alive. I know there's going to be. You know. Young people listening to this. But there's going to be a lot of. A lot of people my age. Maybe older. You survived. We've all, where even if you're, no matter what age you are, you have survived a horrible time in the past. Everybody's gone through horrible times, whether it's bereavement and whatever it is, whether it's physical. I mean, you, you know, a small child breaks their leg. That's a horrible experience. But they get through it. And, you know, you can cuddle them all you like, but their leg's still broken, you know, still got, it's, it's traumatic for everyone involved, really. And it might say, it's just a broken leg, but it's different. An adult breaks their leg, providing they're a healthy young adult, no one really cares. But if a young child breaks their leg, or an elderly person, it's a different thing. We have, we have kind of, it is very, it's almost like a class system of caring. Compassion seems to have a class system in a sense of, well, we'll care about them if they're vulnerable. We'll care about them if they're young. We'll care about them if they're elderly. We'll care about them if they're attractive, but that goes without saying, of course. Yeah, all right then. So, yeah. So weird, isn't it? The whole yeah. That's anyway. Let's move on. I to assume that you know we can't assume that a child is happy and you know they've got nothing. They, what they got to worry about? Well, the reality is it doesn't matter really. What it is, if you move away from it, if a child is emotionally suffering, then they're emotionally suffering. That's that's it. Don't question it. You're going to have to question why, in a sense of sorting it out, if it's a, a serious situation. But... Don't question the fact that they're allowed to have that. Because I think some adults do think, well, what are you worried about? You haven't got to go to work. You haven't got a mortgage. You haven't got to worry about getting any food. We buy your clothes for you. Meh, 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 meh. There's a lot of truth to, there's a lot of truth to that, you know. Being an adult is a lot different to being a kid when it comes to the financial side of things. But every human being, every animal, we've all got the right to feel. We 
we've got the right to be able to bereave in our own way, to grieve in our own way, and to feel happy when we feel happy. So I guess this recording, this long, long, long recording, and it might even be longer, um, means six years, it's nearly an hour and a half already, blimey. What's my point? This is never one point. It's always it always moves into other things. Always moves forward. I hope. So that gap between responding or feeling the feeling uh, and responding. And sometimes it does get wider. It can get wider. So that sometimes, you know what, you think, I can't be bothered to respond. It may also feel like a chore. Oh, oh God, that the gap's so wide now. It's now almost like a, um, a moat in between me, like a, a bit of water. So I have to get into a boat and row across. I can't be asked. I'm just going to let that one go. But then there'll be other times when you think. No, I'm not letting that go. And you will want to respond. And you'd be willing to. Row across that. Water. To get to the other side. To then. But that gives you time to think. There's no point responding and then reacting afterwards. The whole point is responding. And it's okay to respond. I mean, if some if you're able to nip something in the bud so that you don't have to put up with that anymore. That can only be a good thing. I guess. But you have to be open. You have to try and be open to feeling things. And that's hard. I know it's hard. It's hard to allow yourself to be vulnerable. in that way but it's it's part of the being able to feel allowing yourself to feel so it means you can feel pain but you can also feel pleasure unfortunately you can't have one without the other and you can have one without the other separately But you, you know, it's your physical body and your mind and your brain. So that wall needs to be knocked down. You can try and do a. Uh, again, I'm talking about moats. So I'm, I'm stuck into thinking about castles, but it does. F it did used to feel like I was living in a castle with a drawbridge. You know, built. Raising the drawbridge whenever I saw something that I didn't like coming. So something that would be painful. Raise the drawbridge. And that was, I do that in various different ways. You could say alcohol and other things would be my way of pulling up that drawbridge so that I couldn't feel the pain. Or didn't have to feel the pain. But while that drawbridge is up, the pleasure could be there, the other side of the moat. Can't knock on the drawbridge because it can't reach, unless it's got really long arms. So the pleasure feelings are waiting. 
to enter the castle so that you can which is you isn't it the castle is actually you so when that drawbridge is up no feelings can enter so it's it's really kind of you do still need to draw the drawbridge up sometimes you can put it down but if you've got if you're at risk then yeah pull the drawbridge up that's what it's for it's for protection but we don't need to protect ourselves against feeling emotionally feeling some pain as well as feeling pleasure in the event of bereavement it's painful but it's supposed to be but at the same time you've always got almost like an overflow you're like you do having a bath and a sink we've got naturally an overflow built in to ourselves when it comes to emotions so when the emotions get a bit too much and you know if you're bereaving or it's a difficult grieving whatever what's whatever's going on so that that pain raises up but then the overflow it won't allow it to go above a certain level and something that psychologists uh, change therapists, or whatever you want to call them, hypnotists, NLP, psychologists, you know, whatever, they've discovered is with a feeling, when a feeling gets to its most strongest and it keeps getting stronger and it keeps getting stronger and it keeps getting, so it's, let's say it's a really uh, painful emotional feeling, the stronger it gets, the stronger it gets, the stronger it gets eventually it pops it is very much like a bloom it pops and it's no longer there it's no longer there the problem with that is going through the experience uh, which you know, it's it's something that I said. I suppose I could make a recording doing that, but I'd quite like someone to have somebody with them, or go and see a professional therapist. But there's and maybe ask them about that. But you know, everyone's going to do their own thing. So the basically the whole point of what I'm saying is. If there's a painful experience, the more painful it gets, you know, you, you need to allow it to arise, not to react, maybe respond, because sometimes the feeling won't be, it might not be acceptable to you, it might be, you know, especially if you're saying, why me, why me, or why did it happen to me, or I'm responsible for that. Wait a minute. That needs questioning. How are you responsible for that situation? And the reality is, is you probably weren't. Oh, if, I, if I'd have visited him more often, what? You know, you can't go back in time and would it have made any difference to the end of you know the the ending situation the final of what happened i mean bereavement is a great time it's not a great time as in positive but it's a time when people get a chance to really experience all times all types of feelings things that maybe they haven't thought about for a long time and then 
of course, we're faced with our own mortality. And I think that's what's happened to me with the, the family event this week is I've been thinking about myself I probably think about myself far too much really to be healthy but you know I live on my own and I'm I don't have any other responsibilities for other humans apart from my audience I guess I do try my best with that But I've also been concerned about my dad. And he's, his age and his health and um, yeah, I just, he was crying. I heard him crying on the phone when I spoke to my stepmom and he was in the background. Eventually he did talk to me, but I've heard him cry twice before maybe three times yeah I think three times before in my 50 years so it's not something I'm used to seeing and he's 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 more old school keep your feelings to yourself don't express them um, you know so when he does express them it's not because he wants to it's because they they forced themselves out of him and in a way the same thing kind of happens to me but um, that's a different thing I don't know we're not talking about me we're talking about him we're not talking about him either I just that's partly what got me to thinking about making a recording about it there's a very complicated process, a very complicated subject, grief, bereavement, but all the things that are attached to it, just feeling, just being human, you know, regret, um, worry, and this, the stress and anxiety that may be connected to it, but also, in a, in a small way, preparing for it. Preparing for those times when things don't make sense. And hoping that, like the boxer, like the ball player, the cricketer, baseball player, our muscle memory will kick in. So that when bereavement happens, when maybe we're not functioning... Uh, the way we normally do emotionally we are able to deal with it in our own way we're able to maybe function a little bit a little bit better than we would normally have done there's that muscle memory comes in where we're able to not give ourselves a hard time to be kind to ourselves, which is something that's really important. It can seem, it can just seem like words. I know that. And they are words, but very important words. Learning to be kind to yourself. I mean, actually, you know, the change it could make to your life is huge. And I suggest, uh, you know, as I always say at the beginning, at the end of every recording, remember to be kind to yourself. And I mean it. It's so important. Now, I've covered a lot of different things in this hour and 40 minutes. 
blimey, 100 minutes. That's ridiculous. But yeah, anyway, I've covered quite a lot of different things. I've rambled, and I've gone in different directions. I hope I've kind of brought it back at the end of it, brought it back to what I was talking about. Try to, but it's, you know, I might not have done it how you'd like. I might have. I hope that something is useful. Something. I've shared some of my experiences and and that's it I think I could probably talk for another hour and a half but that's not fair on anyone is it come on <laughs> who would have can you have three hours of listening to me blimey so I'm going to go I do intend to make a relaxation session possibly later today so you know um, and that's it that is it so thank you for listening remember I'm just going to say it now I've already said it but remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy and if you question that you deserve to be happy then um, I do actually have a recording somewhere where I talk about that so I can explain everything that I say. I don't just uh, say it for the sake of it. I can go into detail, probably way too much detail than you want. <laughs> but I can. So I just want you to, want you to know it's not just uh, words for the sake of it. It's really not. I'm trying to help in some way. So take care of yourselves. I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye.